uh, we still have a chance to have some impact on the details of this. The larger framework is largely settled. Now, I did mention we're going to be filing a lawsuit. At this point, I'm going to counsel you not to depend on the result of that lawsuit, unfortunately. I mean, we're going to fight hard. We've got a great track record in civil court. Um, we've sued the state, state twice over this five-patient thing. Uh, we successfully sued Centennial, the city of, when the city of Centennial tried to ban this outright, uh, the Arapahoe District Court, which was remarkable because Arapahoe County is not known as a hotbed of marijuana, uh, pro-marijuana sentiment by any means. Um, but we won down there even in a fairly hostile court. And the Arapahoe District Court judge said, Centennial, you can't ban this. You can't ban this because this is a constitutional right. And you are merely the city of Centennial. You can't override the state constitution, even if you're trying to cite federal law, which is what they tried to do. So we won that case. We've got a good track record, but I'm going to be just honest. It is very hard to strike down a state statute. Courts defer to the legislature. There's a presumption of constitutionality of state statutes. The presumption can be overcome. We're going to work hard to overcome it. We're going to have good plaintiffs to do that. We're going to have solid legal arguments to do it. We may not be able to knock the whole thing out. And we may not be able to even knock any part of it out on a facial initial challenge. If we can, that's great. I think it's wise for you, since you've invested time and effort and people's lives depend on this, depend on you remaining in business. I think it's wiser to assume this bill goes into effect, plan accordingly, and if we can knock out some of this, that's a nice bonus, but it, it, it's a better course of action not to rely on our lawsuit. And I'm, I'm just trying to be honest with you here. I don't want to create unreasonable expectations. All right, a couple of highlights of these bills that you've got to keep in mind. Probably first and foremost, uh, the effective date of the bill is July 1st, 2010. This thing is coming up. It's coming up fast. That's the effective date of almost all of the provisions of the bill. There are a couple other provisions that go into effect slightly later. August 1st, you've got to have your uh, application filed with the state. And this is assuming that the Department of Revenue can even put together the form that you're supposed to fill out by then. If they are anything like the Department of Health, uh, which takes, uh, what, eight months now to issue these crappy little one-page red, uh, look like 1950s driver's license registry cards. I'm sure you've seen those things. If you put them in your washing machine, they're gone now. They just, they just got destroyed. Unlike your DMV license, which is a nice piece of plastic that will survive the washing machine a couple times. It's got a person's picture on it. Oh, and by the way, DMV uh, can issue that while you wait. <laughs> Less than a day for $20, great point. $90, uh, these patients are getting ripped off from the Department of Health. So if the Department of Revenue is anything like the Department of Health, uh, they're in for some trouble because the state legislature just told them they've got to get their act together by August 1st. So that's another deadline you've got to keep in mind. But the main deadline, July 1st this year, that means if you are not, if you have not applied to the local government to run your business, and that's any business, both grow and retail side. If you haven't filed an application with the appropriate local government by that date, then you're out of business for a time period while the Department of Revenue works out these regulations and allows you to comply with them. So that's coming up fast and furious. If you're not already in business, get there. Get, and, and if you're in business but you don't have the local application on file, get that filed as quickly as you can. Um, get it done. Now, I can see many questions from people, isn't that a catch-22? I'm in the city of Aurora. The city of Aurora bans this, or at least they've got a moratorium. They won't even accept my application by July 1st. What am I going to do? The answer, unfortunately, is you are caught in this uh, you know, purgatory, if you will. You, you can't file the application. They won't take it. So you are further out of luck in those jurisdictions that have a moratorium. Uh, Centennial is another one. That's an interesting example. We sued them. They passed a moratorium right after we sued them. Uh, so there, there won't be, unfortunately, any operating centers or dispensaries in those cities for a while now because of what the state legislature has done. The state legislature also specifically authorized these localities to extend their moratorium for a longer period of time. That is tough to overcome. Moratoriums are legal. Governments can pass them. Um, they can be struck down if they're too long or they're too unreasonable, but none of them are too long yet. 
under the law as far as we can tell. So you've got your July 1st major deadline, main deadline. You've got your August 1st deadline to fill out the forms. The September 1st deadline is a huge one. And anybody in the retail side of this has got to be mindful of the September 1st deadline by which date you have to certify to the state that you are growing or in the process of growing that 70% of the medicine that you're retailing. So that's the September 1st date. Uh, how do we do that? That is a good question. You know, I'm not an accountant. Um, I do not know exactly how that works. But as I'm talking about accountants, that is, that's an important piece of advice. This business is now becoming a paper trail. In order to justify your right to do business, you've got to retain an accountant and have a good licensed CPA or an accountant or somebody who does this for a living handle your books, take care of your papers. Accountants understand the Department of Revenue. I mean, they do deal with the Colorado Department of Revenue. They deal with them every day. The Department of Revenue is the one who collects sales taxes and profit taxes and income taxes and that sort of thing. And accountants are going to be, in addition to lawyers, my selfish pitch here, um, in addition to lawyers, accountants are going to be partially your saving grace that allows you to do business. So those are the deadlines in the bill, and they are coming up fast and furious. What does the bill do in general? One of the most important things the bill does, and this hasn't been uh, mentioned too much yet, but I think it's, it's an important thing, and it's a good thing, by the way. If, if you look at the definitions in this bill, and please do, you can get the latest versions on my website, you can get the latest versions on the Colorado.gov website, the state legislative website, they're kind of all over there. Um, the definition of medical marijuana center expressly excludes a primary caregiver. If you look at that definition, there's a lengthy definition, it's a, it's a center that sells uh, marijuana to registered patients under the Colorado Constitution, etc. But the very last line of that says, but is not a primary caregiver. So think about what that means. Previous to this bill, the only legal way to grow, sell, transport, possess, use medical marijuana in Colorado was to be either a patient or a primary caregiver or both. That was the only way to do it legally back then. And that, that actually worked okay for a lot of people. Um, what the legislature has done is essentially created a mechanism that is extra constitutional. It's created a statutory methodology for you to grow and sell marijuana legally in Colorado. So it's not based on the Constitution. It is a statutory creation. Now, if that were all they did, I think this would be cause for celebration. But that is not all the state legislature does. It creates this statutory thing, but as the state legislature giveth, it taketh away. And what it taketh away is the caregiver option, and it takes it away in a major, major debilitating way. What it does is it says, first of all, if you opt for the primary caregiver route, you're limited to five patients. So they, they've resurrected this arbitrary five patient number. I can't wait to put Romer on the stand and ask him, where'd you get that number five? Why is six uh, not okay and five okay? Where did that come from? I'll tell you where it came from. Sworn testimony in our 2007 lawsuit, an official of the Department of Health and, and Environment in Colorado testified under oath that five patient limit was the DEA's idea. The United States DEA, your federal government, had an idea that we should limit people to five patients. So that's the genesis of the five patient limit. The DEA came up with that idea. Legislature is following it. So the primary caregiver route has been limited to five patients. And just when you thought that was bad enough, the legislation also says a primary caregiver can't sell marijuana. You can't sell it. Primary caregiver can get reimbursed for the cost of producing the medicine, and it is costly, we all know that, but you really can't sell it. Your patients can reimburse you for the cost. You can also charge for caregiving services. There's always creativity um, in our field. That's what I love about marijuana people. We are free thinkers. We're open-minded. We, we, we come up with ideas. And, of course, if you can charge for caregiving services, you can charge for consulting services, which includes suggesting to the patient the types and strains that might work best, 
the quantities, the methodologies, that sort of thing. So, you know, there may be a, a decent way around that, but that five patient limit is going to be a tough one to overcome. 